second then. Across from the video team, we could try and not look at the screen as much as possible. Okay. Ah, okay. So we should then we'll just remain stay in this here. area. Yeah. Okay. okay. Do you want to click yourself? Oh, yeah, then I'll, then I'll click myself. Okay. Well, then you can see your Does this one? I'm not sure if it works. Good afternoon. So first and foremost, we did not know we will make this talk three hours before. So some of the slides may surprise us as much as they surprise you. First, we introduce ourselves. So Richard Hartman, doing network and project management at Global Ways. Peter Van Einde, my colleague, working in Cisco Tech, and myself, Andrew Yuchenko, I'm uh, from the lunatic fringe at Cisco, doing IPv6. So I'll, I will start with the proverbial question, why, oh, why do you do this? The reality is that IPv4 pool is dry. It has run out. There's only one registry in the world, pretty much, that has significant resources of IPv4 still left. But that by itself is not enough, because besides the global problem with IPv4 exhaustion, we also have a local problem with IPv4 exhaustion. So FOSDEM does have IPv6 prefix that is allocated forever, so the provider-independent prefix, but the situation with IPv4 is much, much, much harder. So IPv4 prefix will literally have to give back as soon as the show ends. So, and actually, well, the part that was originally allocated ran out, so we had to throw in some additional pieces of addresses that we could find around in the configuration. So, why IPv6, why not IPv5, right? That's, that would be a logical step. So, number five was allocated for one of the experimental protocols, which never made it outside the lab and which actually had nothing to do with solving the address exhaustion or... It was a completely different thing than IP itself. So, IPv6, why 128 bits? Normally, well, we all know 64K should be enough for everybody. So 64 bits should also be enough. Well, at the time the IPv6 was beginning to standardize in IETF, there was two camps, each with their strong opinions, because in IETF all of the opinions are very strong. So one of the camps was saying that, well, 64 fixed addresses, that's going to be good. The other camp was saying, no, 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 no. That will be, again, the same problem with 64 Ks. So you'll need to have variable length addresses of unlimited length with no limits. That's pretty hard. So the ITF works on consensus. So consensus is a thing that is equally, makes both sides equally unhappy, right? So that's how we arrive to the 128 bits. And that's a compromise, because 256, that would have been way too much. That would be enough to number all the electrons in the universe and much, 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 much more. So, however, we have this protocol. We need to deploy it, and we have a problem. We have not one problem, we have actually two problems. And we have those problems at each and every part of the internet. No one wants to do the first step, right? Because every communication includes two parts. Well, except now, because I'm the only one talking. Normally, you have to have IPv6 new protocol in each and every part of the network. So this kind of Mexican standoff was happening for a pretty long time, until a few First individuals, then they convinced their companies back in 2011 to, well, pretty much, let's turn it on for a day and see what breaks. There were predictions about the doomsday. The doomsday did not happen. 
So they said, okay, well, we learned something. So there were a few minor things that went a little bit wrong because, well, before that, no one actually turned IPv6 on on a real production scale. Everyone was talking about it, but no one used it. So then with the knowledge of production use, everyone looked and said, so the participants said, hey, looks like it's not too bad. We can turn it on. So a year later, on the 6th of June, Pretty much the same set of players, including some more, because the other players in the industry looked and saw, well, if the guys like Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Akamai can turn it on, well, I actually forgot to include my employer here, sorry. Uh, if they can turn that on, then probably it is reasonably safe to do so. So there is actually many, many, many other content providers that are running both IPv4 and IPv6 today. So if you go to google.com, if you have IPv6, you go to google.com over IPv6. Now, but of course, you will ask the question, so where are the users? Do the unicorns exist? Tomorrow, Eric Winke will have a talk about measurement of IPv4, so I didn't want to steal too much of his fame. Yeah, so I don't tell about the tool that is used to measure these statistics, but let me do a little bit of a quiz of geography, if you know geography. So that's going to be IPv6 geography. So we have country number one who had well, ballpark about 5% of the users going to Google and Facebook and other IPv6 enabled sites were going over IPv6. Which country this is? No. Anyone from France? Anyone from free? Okay, that's, that's about you. Netherlands, unfortunately, no. Ask Eric tomorrow to show you the stats. Country number two. Romania. Correct. That's Romania. In 2012, RCS, RDS enabled IPv6, and it jumped to a value of more than 10%. Country number three. No. Nope. So that's percentage-wise. Uh, here. Ah, okay. So here, the percentage is very, very low. So it's pr practically zero. Here, the percentages are single-digit percent. So the value in, on January 29, 2014 is 6.34%. No. Anyone from Germany? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's Deutsche Telekom starting to enable IPv6 users. You see they have a very methodic approach to IPv6. It is a very nice smooth curve. <laughs> this country. Yes, correct. Swisscom. Belgium. Yes, correct. <laughs> So operators in Belgium start to enable V6, and you see the big jump. So Belgium is actually now one of the most advanced countries when it comes to IPv6, while sharing the palm of leadership with Switzerland. So we're almost at 10%. So the conclusion is the unicorns exist. <laughs> but. 10% is still, it's, it's not enough, right? And this is where I pass the mic and I let you explain what we do at FOSDEM. Yeah, thank you. So, um, as you said, it's, it's not enough. We, we should and we need to do more. And we had a lot of debate about what to do at FOSDEM because we have a relatively unique opportunity to affect a lot of developers. Uh, but on the other hand, we didn't want to affect um, production networks, so you still are able to catch your plane or something. So we have two other networks, especially the dual stack one. If you rely on V4, use the dual stack one. This will work. But let's get on to the future. So FOSDEM is a meeting of hackers, and you are part of this. So 
we hope that you will try and fix your bugs and just improve whatever areas of whatever you're using or developing. Just make it IPv6 enabled. Um, with dual stack, you can run dual stack, as we do, but you still have a problem. You still need v4. And either you do what we did, which is get temporary PI space from RIPE, which we have to give back, or if you are one of the very lucky few, uh, you just have enough IP addresses, IPv4 addresses, which is very uncommon, or you just have bad luck and use NAT within IPv4, because you just don't have any more addresses. So if you're running NAT anyway, why not j try and run NAT in a way which enables you to just use IPv6 in your own network, which makes management and securing your network a lot easier, and you just have one single protocol to worry about in your own network. This works really well, but if you switch off IPv4, you are going to have a problem, because a lot of those sites will not be IPv4 enabled, uh, sorry, IPv6 enabled. They'll still rely on IPv4 only. So you probably don't want to do that just so. Thankfully, I think we have this wrong. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. So um, part of the solution is that the IPv6 space is really, really big. It's incredibly big. Um, it's very big. So um, on this slide, you see the IPv6 space in blue, and the IPv4 space is in red. We invite you to find the IPv4 space. <laughs> Quite literally, you cannot see it. It's, yeah, it, it's just so much more. So every single person, this is a thin line. We just had to make it thicker for visualization um, from, from, from the relative size. Um, this red line is a slash 64. What does this mean? A slash 64 is enough addresses to address literally every single piece of sand above the surface of the sea, and it's almost enough to address all the, one, uh, all the pieces of sand which are below the uh, sea level. So this is quite a lot of address space, and you'll probably not run out. And every single one of your networks at home will have one slash 64. By default, you'll probably get 256 of those networks, so you are able to just do subnetting whatever you want. You can do your telephony in one subnet, you have your computers in another, you have your video monitoring in yet another. You, you have so much space, you never ever have to worry about space or address exhaustion again, which is quite nice. But still, and this is why we switched up the slides, but doesn't matter. Um, how do we get from the we 6 only internet in your local network, or for example on the FOSDEM network, to the V4 on the global internet? Well, the answer is basically, um, when I send out a request and I get back an A record, which tells me, for example, guardian.co.uk has this and that IP address. If they were not to send a quad A record, which is where they hide the IPv6 address of the website, uh, what we do is we lie to you. Um, what I mean by that is basically we take the A record, which you get as an answer, rewrite it on the fly to give you an quad A record containing a, a IPv6 address, and once you start accessing this address, we start to translate this back into v4 for you, without you noticing. Um, there will be some uh, explanation of this soon. Yeah. Um, so that's basically what, the, what I just uh, explained. DNS64 is the mechanism of taking an, an A record, which you get as a reply, and returning quad A um, as an answer. You basically map the whole internet into, into a tiny, or the whole IPv4 internet, into a tiny, tiny subnet of your own network, which is a slash 96. So uh, that's really tiny compared to your slash 64, which you have uh, at home or wherever. So you have more than enough space to, to map this. The configuration of bind is really simple. It's basically this, and you're done. So there's not much reason not to use this. And now for the visual explanation of how this actually works. So you've got your own IPv6 enabled local network, and you've got the IPv4 legacy network on the left-hand side. 
And now you want to access some random website which is not IPv6 enabled. So what happens? You ask your resolver for the address of your web uh, legacy website. Your resolver asks the, the authoritative server, gets back an A record, which it's not too happy with, so it rewrites the one. It adds an additional quad A record into the reply which you're getting from the DNS server. This is the part where we lie to you, for good reason. And now your local computer knows there are two possible IP addresses on which I can access the remote machine. One V4 address and one V6 address. But as you don't have any V4 in your local network, your computer will use V6. But you're not, uh, yeah. So now you need to go to the uh, V4 internet from your V6 uh, network. Basically what you do is you just access the, um, the V6 address. Your router, or in this case our router, will recognize this as being a mapped address. We'll look at what it has to translate to, and then it will send on your packet into the v4 part of the internet, sorry, with an actual v4 address. So it just works normally within the v4 uh, internet. You just get normal IPv4 responses back to your traffic, and then we translate it back again to the v6 address. And this is how you, with your IPv6 only device on our FOSDEM SSID, will be able to use v6 only. So, on to the results. Oh, yeah. So, uh, this one? so, this morning we. Uh, you have to. Oh, yeah. 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 So, uh, this morning we uh, tested NAT64 and it worked. So, we. Just turned it on and turned off IPv4. So uh, then we announced this, and hopefully enough people heard it uh, and could move to dual stack in case it didn't work for them. <laughs> Intentionally, okay. Uh, so a lot of people were like uh, IPv6 virgins and. Uh, got an IPv6 IP for the very first time. I hope they liked the experience. And some people discovered bugs. It will be hard to fix VMware Fusion, but some other products like Mosh, we can maybe fix. Uh, yeah, you do need a Wi-Fi to have IP, of course. <laughs> but uh, it was relatively okay. Um, the main problem with IPv6 over wireless is that it depends on multicast to get your uh, advertisements. So sometimes you might lose neighborship with the router or you might lose your default gateway, for example. There's not much we can do about it. Um, ah, yeah, and uh, Dropbox doesn't work either. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, here we can see the network traffic. You can uh, maybe see the little bump when the WRC controller crashed. So we have like several hundred megabits of outgoing traffic. And some of them actually are using the 5 gigahertz range, so it's okay. So most people should have had a stable connection. There were a few nasty people that were announcing the FOSDEM SSID, but luckily we can uh, block them. Uh, find the WRC controller crash. Uh, actually it's not so we had about almost 4,000 concurrent uh, clients. And this is again the bandwidth, so about 200 megabits in and about 30 megabits out. Uh, the video streaming was all wired, luckily. But this is a really disappointing graph. The cool people are on the right. 
people on the left are probably Nexus users, uh, Android. Because um, one of the problems is that Android comes up and says, I want to have an IP. And the router says, here is IPv6. And it says, I don't have V4, so I don't have internet. So then you have to escape to dual stack. Um, fruity devices are in the right. Recent fruity devices. With this, FOSDEM is actually the very first conference for the general public. Uh, RIPE and other things, they're not really general public, they're really weird people that have IPv6 on as a default. IPv6 only. So this is like historical. Uh, do you want to continue with this tomorrow? Now there's one add-on that's not on the slides. Who, who here knows about DNSSEC? You were, if you are using DNSSEC on your routers, on, on your laptops, and you are IPv6 only, it will probably scream at you. Because remember, we are lying to you. So. It's not our fault. Please complain with the people that uh, are not using IPv6 yet. It's not tunnels where we're meant to fall. <laughs> Sorry? It's not tunnels where we're meant to fall. <laughs> tunnel. It, uh, he says it was tunnels were invented for. Uh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah? Okay. So. Uh, Q&A? Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's working. Can you, does this work? No, it doesn't. Yeah. This works? Yeah. Reboot. Uh, what for, his iPhone is not joining the net. What version? That should. <laughs> I'm on the network. <laughs> yeah, so when I shouted reboot, I was not joking. I did, yes. Um, in your chart of client counts on each SSID, is there a reason you didn't include the dash v6 SSID? Because I've been using that one all day. That, that's my fault, I'm sorry, because otherwise they were all very small and hard to see. So I took the two biggest ones and put them here. Yeah, so the, the cooler, even cooler people are here. <laughs> yeah. How many of the sponsors' websites do native IPv6? <laughs> Hmm? No, the, the can, internet, you can you repeat the question, please? How many of the FOSDEM sponsors' web companies' websites support native IPv6 without any NAT64? How many? Uh, uh, let me put it this way: anybody who uses Akamai does. <laughs> So uh, I know for a fact that Cisco does, Red Hat does, uh, Google, does. Google does, of course. Um, I don't know the sponsors for how it's Canonical does. Canonical, yes. O'Reilly program does? Unfortunately. So I noticed that you're not using the allocated range, the, the allocated global Anycast DNS 6.4 range for the quad A's that you're handing back. Any reason? Yeah, the CLI for ASR1K does not allow. <laughs> <laughs> so we're using the operator specific prefix which we take out of the V6 range.
there's one more question. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're waving somebody else. No, I'm sorry. Um, who else? Uh, there's, there's a gentleman. Well, yeah. Maybe we'll just... Yeah. No, it's, it's okay. I'm curious to know how many APs you have around just to support 5,000 people. I don't think we have any actual numbers. We don't run, uh, we don't run the access points. You'll beat us. But, uh, yeah, how many access points? Uh, about 800. About 800. We have about... Uh, and obviously we are putting quite a few of our own into the hotspots, but else we rely on their infrastructure. And they just put in the additional SSIDs and give us the VLANs and we do stuff with it. We, uh, we have at most about 80 users per AP. Anyone else? <laughs> what? Uh, turning uh, oh, no. somebody who should know better. A troll. <laughs> ask if we're going to turn dual stack off yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> when? Next year. <laughs> Anyone else? So let me ask the question then. How many people use V6 only society today? Post them. Okay. How many people experienced some applications not working on the V6 only society? Okay. So how many people have reported or will report this to the Okay, that, so it would be great if the last number matches the last but one. Or even better, if you're a developer of the app, then yeah, you don't need to report. It depends on the app. To the, to, to the, crea to the uh, writers of the application, of course, to the vendors. If it's a Cisco product, yes. Yes, yes if it's a Cisco, <laughs> of course. Uh, for reference, it was uh, three out of the 12 sponsors' websites support IPv6. <laughs> Thanks. So thank you very much.